This is February 12th, 2002. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Program. My name is John Coates, and this morning we have with us Herbert Skellett. Is that Skellett correct? Right, that's right. And they called you Herb, if I understand you correctly. Herb, right. Herb, welcome, and we're very glad you're here today. Thank you. Uh, may I ask you, when you were born, I was born on uh, November 18th, 1920. You're 81 years old? 81 years old. 81 years old. And your current address? In Quincy, Massachusetts. And were you born in Quincy? or? In I was born in Quincy, about a half a mile from the John Adams house. Really? Yeah. That's a good neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice place. <laughs> and uh, your current marital status? Uh, my wife passed away 11 years ago. And do you have children, Herb? My, uh, I had two daughters. They uh, passed away just past year. Really? That's yeah. very sad. Yeah. Did, do you have any uh, grandchildren? I have uh, two grandchildren. When and where did you enter the military? I uh, entered the military in uh, Boston and uh, in July of 1942. And under what circumstances? Were you drafted or did no, you decide I, you wanted to get into the Navy? And well, I was down? working at the Fort of a shipyard uh, at the time and uh, I was just patriotic and uh, I just wanted to go in and see some action, I guess. So uh, went through the Fargo, uh, uh, well, from Newport. From Newport, Rhode Island, we did six weeks of uh, training. And uh, after the uh, training there, I was sent to the uh, Pier 92 in, in uh, New York. Okay, let's, let's just back up a second. When you went into the service, uh, did any of your friends go in with you, or were you no, pretty much on, on your own? I went on my own. And when you signed up, was it... Um, for the duration, that is, you would have to stay until the war was over and... Well, uh, Navy Reserve, yes. Okay, so um, you knew that you had to stay in at least until the war was over. Oh, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, you went in in July 42, that's about seven months... Six after, months after Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor. Yeah. And why did you pick the Navy instead of uh, Army or Marine Corps, Coast Guard? Well, uh, I was born in Quincy, then about, when I was nine or ten years old, my father moved to Nantasca Beach, and that's the town of Hull. And that's on the, uh, Nantasca is a peninsula, and the, the water is, were, was just all water around you, you know. In other words, when I, in our bedroom in Nantasca, at night, the Boston light, but every couple of minutes would shine in the window, that's how, uh, just, uh, just used to the ocean, I guess. You felt this, you were made to be a Navy man. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And they even arranged to have a lighthouse shining through <laughs> your window. The well, Boston Light was the first lighthouse built in the United States. Well, that's, that's, that's a very good explanation. So you went, to, you went into Boston, you signed up, you got sent to Newport. And wh how long were you at Newport? Oh, six weeks. And this is kind of basic training. Yes. Marching around and we getting a uniform. And At one time down there they had a, uh, like a football field and there was a big, they put a big ball, round ball about six feet around. That was part of the training. They put about 50, just estimating about 50 men on one side and 50 on the other side. They blow the whistle and charge each other to see which group would uh, get the ball through the goal, goal line of the other. But, uh, it got a little rough and the people started breaking the rams and getting a few ribs broken, so they had to stop it. Because uh, a few of them went to the hospital. So uh, then at night time they told if anybody spoke out of line while you was hit your sack, uh, they put your sea bag, you had to go walk around the island with your sea bag on. It was, it was good, good training. <laughs> they had to be in pretty good shape to get out of there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> after they broke your arm and <laughs> ribs and everything else. Well, you were there. 
uh, did they give you tests or something to decide what you would do in the Navy? You know, um, whether you would be a signal man or a gunner or something like that? Well, they asked us a few times. They told me I wanted to be a gunner. So, uh, from there, they, uh, I don't know if that meant anything then to them then, but uh, I finally became a gunner. After six weeks then, they sent you, you said, to where? Pier 92. That's in, where the, you, in New York? In New York, to okay. wait, wait for a ship. And you were waiting for a ship? Yeah. Had you had training in gunnery at that point? No, no nothing. So when you went aboard a ship, you were just about as raw a recruit well, right. as, I was as just you a could boat. be. Yeah. And this is July, this about August of 42? Uh, Pier 92. What, what, the, the, uh, going back a little bit, at Pier 92, when I was waiting there, we there a couple of weeks. Uh, we, they, the, the commander down there had us marching all day long in the hot sun. And uh, without a drink of water, just march, march, march. It was hard to believe, so I don't know if you ever remember Walter Winchell. Sure. He, he got, Walter Winchell got, got uh, wind of that. and. Uh, he investigated it, and I guess they transferred the commander out of there anyway, because he was going a little too far with the men. Can you tell us where uh, Pier 92 is in New York? Well, all the piers right off of, straight, uh, all the piers are right together there. In fact, at that time, the uh, Normandy, remember the Normandy, we had, a, we had a stand watch at the Normandy part time. There was a ship that burnt, it was a French liner. Yeah, that was in the Hudson River. Yeah. Okay. We had to go over there and stand watches on that sometime, just to, while we were there. And finally, on September 5th, they sent us a Brooklyn Navy ad. And uh, I didn't even know what kind of a ship I was going on, but it was a destroyer. And uh, we were, went aboard a few, I forget how many went aboard the ship, maybe a dozen or so. In September of 42, you finally get a ship. Finally got a ship. And you're trained in gunnery. I uh, didn't have my training yet. You, oh, you hadn't had that yet? No. Okay, what was the ship that they sent you to? The U USS Niblack, the 424. N-I-B-L-A-C-K? Right. And this was this a brand new destroyer? No, or? she was in commission in 1940. Okay, so it wasn't that old. No, Yeah. she was built in Bath, Maine. What were your feelings about getting a destroyer? Well, I didn't know what I was getting into, but uh, I, like, I liked it after I got on board a while. Uh, yeah, I like it. Yeah. You had I, to like it. I, I think uh, crackling that paper is going to be picked up on the microphone, so oh, oh, you're, sorry. You're, you can certainly refer to it, but yeah. you're going to wonder where the funny sounds came from. Tell us about going aboard a ship for the first time uh, you are still kind of a, a new recruit, and were all the fellows with you as new as you to the Navy? Yeah, all of them, yeah. Okay, now you're on board a ship in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and this is going to be your home for quite a while. Um, tell us about walking aboard and looking around and what they told you to do. Well, we walked aboard and uh, just put a sea bag there and as far as I remember, they gave us a bunk, and right away they put us over the side of the ship, chipping paint. So uh, that didn't go over very good. <laughs> we chip the paint, and uh, in, the, in the way you chip the paint, they have a blade in the chipper. And uh, well, I guess, oh, well, anyway, I dropped one in the water. I guess once you drop in the water, they're gone. Uh, the boats are made of whoever was looking at it. He asked me, I said, uh, do you want to do something else? I said, sure, anything. So they put me in the scullery in the mess hall. Uh, so <laughs> it was better than chipping paint. So a lot of guys dropped them in the water, I take it. <laughs> Just to get out of there, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so you're now in the gallery and... and uh, it was, yeah. Did they you what they call the scullery. Scullery and where you on, a cook on or... A, on a destroyer, it was scullery where you, were, you had to close the door because in rough weather. You were really secure, and it was really, uh, they had to do that when you were out to sea. You, but you, this is not your heart's desire to be on board a ship ser serving food, is it? No, but you no. had to look around, you had to look around to see. Uh, but as we, uh, 
Well, from there anyway, when, once we got underway, we uh, took our first trip to uh, Ireland. To where? To Ireland. We took a convoy over to Ireland. And uh, one of the first trip, a lot, a lot of kids, even even some of the sailors got seasick out the harbor. We hit a terrific storm. Uh, uh, the North Atlantic is about the roughest water there is in the world anyway. Well, one storm we hit was, uh, people wouldn't even believe it, 80 foot waves. When you get to the top of the wave, you just look down the smokestack of a freighter next to you was so high. And uh, say from the mess hall to the quarter deck, say there was 15, uh, 18 steps on a ladder. You could step at the bottom and the ship went down from the wave. You could be in the, in the quarter deck by two steps two or three steps, it's so fast that I got to just drop it, you know. We rolled over the bulkhead, we made rolled over 55, 60 degrees. Sta actually stand in the bulkhead. You didn't think he'd come back, it was a miracle. Huh? Some, some destroyers have got lost in bad weather. Was, in was this your first time at sea? Had you ever been out the on the ship? Time, yeah. What did you think of all this, that you were going to sink? Oh yeah. We, we we lucky it don't really tip it was really it was really bad. On this trip, uh, I assume somebody was also teaching you gunnery or something. Oh no, we didn't teach anything on the on the first trip. We didn't. We just did what we had to do at the time. But uh, what what did you do? You well, weren't shipping. Well, we came back. No, when I got into the gunnery, it was later on. We came back to the states. We took the convoy over to uh, we. we uh, Stopped at Lissahalli in uh, Northern Ireland and uh, uh, Londonderry. Then we came back to the States. Then we went down, we took a trip down. We had a, another convoy, escorted a couple of ships, and we were down in the Caribbean. And, down, and when we were down in the Caribbean, we'd, uh, they uh, asked me you know, if I wanted to do so I said, I want to be a gunner or something. So they put me on a 20 millimeters. And uh, we'd practice down there. They have a plane, shoot, carry up what they call a drone. It was just a, a target, probably a, a half, a, no, half a mile, quarter mile. So when you aimed a 20 millimeter at that drone, 20 millimeter, every other, every, every other shell is, is a tracer. So you, you'd be able to get your Mac. When the tracer got, you'd be able to sight the drone better. And, uh, was practiced down there anyway. With the, uh, I did pretty good with it, so they left me as a gunner, and uh, that was my job as a gunner there. So, this is a it, twenty millimeter cannon, and it had a drum. It's a drum, yeah. It filled yeah. with how many rounds? Uh, what? Oh, I forget how many rounds in it. But, uh, and and you got pretty good shooting at these drones that flew by. Yeah. Uh, so they said, "Fine, the job is yours." And were you on? Cannons for the rest of the time on board ship. On what? Were you shooting 20 millimeter cannons for the rest of the time you were aboard? Yeah, uh, at that time too. The, uh, when you're in destroyer, you do a little bit of everything. At that time, we had torpedoes. We had four torpedoes. We could do uh, when you're out to sea. It's di different different watches. You get five. We have five 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 inch guns. You do. Uh, Watches on the five-inch gun. You know how to load them in the, from the handling room. They would, uh, well, anything like that. You stood a watch. You four on, four off, wherever. D different watches in middle of the night or whatever. So you, when you'd got get up, yeah. you weren't sure where you would be assigned. Uh, when you stood a watch, no, you didn't. You didn't know where you. They'd be assigned. say go to the five-inch this time or the torpedoes right. this yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah, you could uh, you could uh, learn your way around every place on the ship. Was really. everybody on the ship interchangeable like that? Yeah, yeah. That's most most everybody could could take over. There's one guy. If say you were in action, somebody got knocked out. Somebody else could take over. Yeah. About how many men were aboard? The size of the crew. Peacetime, I think a destroyer carried about 150. And one time to to man all the guns and everything, it was around 270, around 270 to 300. Can you tell us uh, the ship you were on? 
Was this considered a big destroyer or a typical destroyer? Typical destroyer. It was a Cleves class. If that means anything, it's a. In fact, one of the ships in that squadron was built in for Master Benson. Who I think the Benson and the, was the only one built from Fall River that was in that squadron. But we the, we had uh, Benson, the Gleaves, Mayo, Ludlow, Plunkett. But a few few of those got hit when we were overseas. Doing. You mentioned traveling in a convoy before. Um, a lot of people who were never in the Navy heard about them. But tell us what it's like to go up on a deck and look out and see all these ships around you. What's, what's the feeling that you have about this? Well, it's, it's a great feeling. With the biggest convoy when we were in the, uh, Casablanca, we took a convoy to Casablanca. It was the biggest convoy, the largest convoy ever in the, in the world. It was approximately 60 ships. That's a big convoy. And uh, we, we had to go the speed of the slowest ship. Yeah. Say, say the ship would go eight knots, so we could go maybe 10 or 15 because we were protecting the whole convoy with submarines. So we get a ping, they got, uh, we had what they call sonar gear. Uh, if they had a ping, if you were in the bridge, you could always hear the ping. All the time the ship is underway, you hear that ping noise. And they have the sonar men that they got a hit metal or they could tell if it was just how how near or how far away the object was if it was a submarine. Sometimes it might hit a whale or a fish or something, but they, they were trained for that. That was a separate thing. They could tell the difference? The yeah, most of the time. Sometimes they might get fooled, but I think nine times out of ten they could tell if it was a sub. Can you describe the, the size of some of the other ships? Uh, were, were you the largest was a destroyer, or were there cruisers, oh, no, we had, we had cruisers battleships? battleships. Uh, going in you know, there, Battleship Massachusetts was with us. Uh, Battleship Massachusetts was built on four of a shipyard. In fact, I worked, I was working on the Massachusetts when I left the four of a shipyard to join the Navy. And after that, when Ma Massachusetts was, uh, well, she did, uh, want me to tell you about it? When we were in the Casablanca, the battleship, uh, there was a French cruiser named the Jean Bat. And uh, Massachusetts, crippled the dream bat to put a big hole on the side. And uh, we, we had, during that, we had out of screening around there, but uh, we didn't, we were lucky we didn't get too much action there. We dropped a few trip charges, but and, uh, they didn't, it was it was much easier than expected going into Casablanca than, uh, than other invasions. Was the Jean Bart the uh, French ship that lost French cruiser. One of its cannon up in front, it, it looked, all the pictures of it was crooked and hanging there. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I guess, that made all the New York papers. When you're off Casablanca and you're a part of an invasion force, or at least the convoy force that brought over the invasion troops, uh, can you describe what that was like to be part of that? Yeah, well, you're, it's the first time. It's the first time we went in there. It was you, you were on edge naturally? Anybody would be on edge, and you didn't know when. To, well, if it was German subs on, you know, first time you're, you know, you're on the tin can. We, you know, destroyers call it tin can. It's tin can navy, Dungaree navy. The first time, uh, you're, you're a little bit on edge, but just uh, waiting. But, we were lucky we all got back sick. We come back to the States after that. What was your specific job at Casablanca when you were with the fleet offshore there? What were you doing? My job was just just to sta stand and watch mostly. And you had, uh, when you're on watch, you just uh, have a pair of goggles. And uh, that was the main, main thing at first, just to get used to it, I guess, before you did anything. What did it sound like, the the attack on a uh, a place like this? Well, that, that, that wasn't bad. I mean, go, going into the other invasions, that was a picnic to us. We were on the mostly the outer screen. You were on the Atlantic side. Oh yes. You weren't not on the Mediterranean. No, we didn't go in the Mediterranean until the next trip. 
Okay, this is the Casablanca. Um, what time is this in 42? In the fall that was of in November of 42. November. So was this part of the main attack? Uh, that, so that's the 8th of November. Right. Uh, when the other f part of the fleet was invading uh, through the Mediterranean, is that correct? No, we didn't start yet. We went in there on the next trip. Okay. We went uh, the next trip. Uh, when we go on with that? Uh, sure. You got back to the States after Casablanca. Well, we went back to the States. Uh, we made a few. Uh, we had to go into the Navy overhaul, and we come, come back to Brooklyn. Most of the guys, when you go back to the States, most of them would rather go to the Brooklyn Navy Yard because they go in New York City. And uh, the worst port they like to go into was uh, North Park. Uh, you know. That's where they all seem to go today. That uh, well, they had a sign down in Norfolk: "Dogs and sailors stay off the grass." And they, they <laughs> <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> when you got back to New York and refitting, what does that entail? You, do you, you're something wrong with your ship, or you? Well, just yeah, every, every every time you went back to the Navy Yard, yeah, they, they, they well, they check everything over. Every, every ship that goes out to sea, you know, for a month or so or less, they'd, they'd go back to the Navy, they'd give you what we call a Navy Yard overhaul. Uh, we don't know what they did to it, but they got the Navy Yard working in there. And, they, and you they, guys got liberty all the time? That, yeah. Uh, that's, that's hard to take, isn't it, to yeah, be, it was, yeah. It was tough. <laughs> yeah. Did you get to go home from there? I would, uh, I'd say in the three and a half years I did in the Navy, I got home about four times. I don't, during the war time, I mean, pe people today, they go over six months and they, they expect to be home right away, but uh, it doesn't work that way. But it's altogether different today anyway. The only on destroyer too, the newer, the newer ships and destroyers, we didn't have air condition, uh, we didn't have videos, uh, in, the, in them days, you, you didn't have a, anything like that, you know what I mean? But today they have all that stuff. Was, I mean, uh, this ex-Marine over here told me. <laughs> let's, let's look at that a little here. Um, what did you do on board ship when you, you got your time off, you, you've, you're off duty? Well, it was seaman, seaman first class. And what did what did you do to kill time? We when you were on ship. Yeah. We didn't. There's always something to do. You worked in the mess hall. Uh, when you brand new, when you're brand new, you just uh, wash down the decks and uh, things like that. There was no such thing as uh, leisure time on a board ship. Uh, that you're off duty to read, to write letters, to clean your cannons or whatever you had to do? Well, you know, you could strike for a certain thing, you know what I mean? But uh, when you see me, you'd, you'd strike for uh, whatever they wanted to do. But, uh, you better explain the use of the word strike here, uh, what that means. Well, say you want to strike for, uh, well, whatever, whatever uh, it's hard, it's hard to describe. Some people want to be a signalman, some people want to be a, a gunner's mate, uh, uh, different, different things like that. It means to work toward an objective. To work, work towards what your goal, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, you're going to leave New York, I take it, after your ship is uh, put in working condition. Where did you go from there? From there we went to... Uh, we took another convoy. Every time we'd leave, we'd take a convoy overseas. Then we went into uh, Mirzal Kabir, uh, Oran, North Africa. And uh, we were in there ready to uh, invade Sicily. Sicily was uh, next to invasion. And uh, from Mirzal Kabir, there was a lot of ships in there. And I was thinking, there were so many ships in there, I was thinking it could be another Pearl Harbor. I was wondering why they had so many at one time, you know what I mean? But a few times they'd have German observation planes go over that they'd have planes that probably chase them away, but I, I, was, I was just thinking if they ever bombed a place it would have been another Pearl Harbor. 
This is the gathering the fleet to get ready to go to Sicily, yeah. yeah. I was surprised that they did that, but uh, they got away with it. Did you get ashore at North Africa? Oh, yes. We were ashore in uh, Mirza al Kabir. Well, uh, Oran was the place they had, you know, made a liberty in. Mirza al Kabir, to get into Oran, there's a big tunnel in the side of the mountain. You had to go through the tunnel to get into Oran. But uh, they were told, they were told, uh, Always to travel and never go over alone. Because we went very liked wherever you went over there, you went very liked. So, uh, I know a couple of a couple of our sailors went over alone and they come back in their shots. They steal the clothes, I mean they come back in the new a couple of them. So, this uh Iran was a gathering place for a great many men, ships, supplies and things. Um a very, very busy place. Did you um, did you participate in any of the uh, loading of your ship or the getting ready for the invasion? Oh yeah. Every, well, ever you went, everybody aboard always had a uh, carry ammunition, carry uh, stores. Every, everybody, all hands, always did that. If this was such a uh, obvious gathering of an invasion fleet, were, were you bombed? Did the Germans do anything except no, fly no, observation planes? No, 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 they never bombed us there. Isn't that interesting? We must have had the Air Force, I think, taking care of So them. you had complete control of the yeah. skies there. We had a, uh, even in Mirza al Kabir, they had a, a repair ship called the Vulcan. But any slight repairs you need, they could uh, take care of it there. Tell us about uh, shoving off and uh, heading towards Sicily. Well, heading towards Sicily, we didn't know where we were going. At that time, we were, when we were going to invade Sicily, we were going up the coast. You, so you go right on the coast of North Africa into uh, into Sicily, and uh, we went in there. And it was really it was it was really uh, fireworks in there. We went in there, and there was German tanks coming over the hill. We were firing at the German tanks. And, uh, you guys were firing at German tanks? Which five inch German, five inch guns? Five inch guns, yeah. German tanks. And the air raids, the air raids were really, really bad. How close were you to the shore? We go to the shore, five or six, five hundred yards or so, we would go right close to the beach. So you could have used your 20 millimeter cannons oh, yeah. there? Yeah, did you? Oh yeah. We could use the 20 millimeters. Uh, we didn't have the 40s on yet to the next couple of trips. We had the 20 millimeters, uh, five inch. But 20 millimeters, most of the use of five inches on the shore, but uh, we had a lot of air raids. We, they were, they were Germans were really coming down there. That's where you would come in with your 20 yeah, millimeters. 20 millimeters. Yeah. They, they, they Did really you ever down. shoot at a German plane? Pardon? Did you ever shoot at a German plane? Oh, yeah, quite a few times. Tell us about that, would you? Well, I'm pretty sure that I knocked down one or two of them, but when everybody's firing the five inches and the twenty millimeters, and it's it's, a, it's just the whole the whole sky would would, would light up. It, it just it's indescribable. The ammunition is going up there. How anybody anything could go through. In fact, it was. This is something they never printed much. It's in some of the history books. There was thirty-two. Uh, transports, paratroopers, was flying over the convoy at night, and whoever gave them orders to do that is re it was ridiculous. You never fire uh, a friendly plane over a convoy. We knocked down 32 transports, right in Sicily, and I never read much of it. It's in the history books. You read about it, but it's a God's honest truth. 32 transports they lost. To why we were in an air raid with the Germans. I don't know if you ever heard about that. I think it's been mentioned, mm -hmm. um, but it's one of those tragedies that's called friendly fire, I guess. Yeah, right. But I don't know who gave them the orders to fly over a convoy, especially when you, when the Germans are raiding us, you know? Yeah, and everybody's really trigger happy. Sure, you, you're just firing. Yeah. Firing anything you see up there. Well, let's. That brings up a point. Did you have training in aircraft identification? 
No, when they come at you, we, we know it was a German plane. They'd ring general quarters, you are the main your battle stations. We had battle stations sometimes four or five hours at a time. Just uh, So if it moved, you shot it? Then you over there, we shot it. Yeah, okay. And they're going so fast coming at you, we, you don't know where it was. The same way with up in the Pacific, where Bob was, the kamikazes were out there. They, the kamikazes were all suicide planes. The Germans didn't have suicide planes, but it's, it's a, we're being shot at, you well, no matter where you are, it, it's your life. What What was coming after you? Were these Hinkles? Were these Messerschmitts? What kind of planes were they? Dornier 217s, or Messerschmitts, Luftwaffe, or whatever. I don't know, then if I looked in the book, I'd probably... So you were getting bombed and strafed? Uh... We got bombed, there was, I couldn't believe it, bombs flying so close to us, exploding so close to us. The fuel of our ships got hit. In fact, General, we had a ship there uh, that was in command, it was the Monrovia. General Patton was on the Monrovia at that time. And he, he had not gone ashore yet? No, he didn't go ashore, he was, he was on the <clears> ship. <throat> I had a friend of mine on the Monrovia, he was telling me all about that. Uh, Tell us about looking around and seeing ships hit. Uh, what was it like? It's unbelievable to see ships go down, see planes crashing in the water. It's, uh, it's an awful sight. You, you, you're under fire, too, from the shore at the same time. You mentioned tanks firing out. German you. tanks were firing in October. They, we didn't wipe them out pretty good. Was there any uh, German naval activity? Did they have any e-boats? Uh, yes, like I'll this? tell you about that. We went over. We were down La and Gila when we invaded there. We went through there, and then we had to go around to the, uh, imagine it's they call the western side uh, towards Syracuse, Sicily. That's where uh, Mount Etna is. Uh, we had a German e-boat attack us. She fired three torpedoes at us, and they missed, all three of them missed, and they went, uh, they missed, uh, they went by our fantail and they exploded on the beach. And uh, we, we, we destroyed, we got that e-boat. We sank, well, during the war, we sank a few wee boats and uh, they were different. They had well, submarines, everything like that. You don't know what you were running into. You're on the western side of Sicily? The Syracuse side, yeah. Yeah. Going up towards Messina Straits. So you were, um, let's see if I re remember this, you were uh, supporting Patton's attack up the west side of Sicily? Yeah. And where... Well, we, we really, uh, th this is, we went up there alone, up the west side of Sicily. We didn't have any other destroyers with us. Just, uh, we had a PT, PT boat, but I don't know where the PT boat was one of ours. I don't know where she was stationed, but she was with us when we were going up there, when the German e-boat attacked us. And, uh, we, we were lucky we didn't get torpedoed then. Yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, this is interesting. A PT boat is accompanying you. Where yeah. where did where did it get its supplies? I have no idea where it comes from. <laughs> it was there. Yeah. Then they, and where did you go? Where where did you continue to? We lost it. We we uh, I don't know where she went after that. She didn't stay with us. No, I mean where did you go? Well, we went up in. Uh, uh, up through the uh, Straits of Messina, up into uh, Palermo. Palermo, Sicily. Did you go ashore at Palermo? Yeah, after a while, well, that was our base. Palermo was our base after a while. In fact, when, when Palermo was our base, one night we left Palermo, uh, there was a, the cruise of Boise, and there was another tin can with us, I, th I believe it was the Gleaves. We were the first. We were the first ship to, to uh, bombard the European mainland in Italy. Called Palmi, Italy. P A L M I. We knocked out some bridges. This is in the middle of the night. We were in the dark, and uh, we fired the five, just mainly five inches. Uh, we couldn't even see the beach right there, but they fired back at us. We got out of there quick, but 
I did, from our reports, we uh, destroyed bridges and electric uh, places and uh, whatever, whatever we need, needed. This is just getting them ready for the next invasion of Salerno. The German army was, was able to uh, get a lot of guys off of Sicily back across the straits to the Italian mainland yeah. and the American Navy among others uh, belatedly tried to head them off. Were you any part of that uh, bunch that uh, sailed up through the straits to try and stop this retreating back to the mainland? No, we didn't get into that, no. Could you ever, I guess my question is from a land lover's point of view, how could you tell where you were at, uh, at night? Uh, you just described shooting at the, the Italian mainland. Did you people, were you told where you were? No, we didn't tell us. We was? didn't know until afterwards. Whenever we went in to make an invasion, we didn't even know where we were. Later on, we went in and invaded Anzio. We didn't know where we were going. We were supposed to go back to the States, in fact, after Sicily. We, well, we went back then. Then we came back again, and we were supposed to go back to the States, and they held us over there to make a... We made a Vangio of Angio. Remember John Charles Daly was on What's My Line? John Charles Daly was our news reporter when we uh, invaded Anzio. That was after Salerno. We invaded Salerno first. I'm getting ahead of myself. We invaded Salerno first. Then we, a couple of, few months later, then we went to Enzio. But that was made another trip home before that. Can you, in your own mind, rate uh, a, a difficulty of an invasion uh, from seen from your perspective? Salerno and Anzio are two very big names in the, in the campaign yeah. there. Can you say which you felt was, from your uh, point of view, worse? Well, they're, they're all bad, but, but uh, I, I was pretty cool all the time, but uh, by the time we make an angie, I was getting a little bit a little uh, nervous. I, was, I figured, how many, how many kinds, times can you invade a place and still not get hit? And I, I figured that was getting pretty close to my time. And uh, we made angie, oh, Germans were sinking hospital ships. Uh, they sank one hospital ship, I remember, the, the St. David, the name of it was. Uh, we seen an ammunition ship get blown up next to us. And one of the worst things I ever seen. I mean, anybody that would just, it was, was a, it's so Im, impossible to describe to see an ammunition get, you know, ship get hit. I should think everybody within five miles of it uh is rained, shrapnel is coming down yeah. parts of the ship and everything else. When you're on board a ship like that, what is the thing you're most afraid of? Um, planes coming around, strafing Just you? Air, air rage. Air rage mostly, because they come out of the sky and you would never know it. Uh, do you know it? What uh, if, it's, if one of our look out to something spotted in the first, but uh, they'll come out of the sky at, at dusk or, or morning. Main time they come out, usually is in the morning. They come out of the sun or at night come out you know, at dusk, but you never know when they were going to come. But uh, sometimes we'd stay at general quarters hours and hours at a time. I was just going to ask you that. Were you under the tension of being at general quarters all the time. You're, you're Well, you're living, just waiting for them to yeah, come at you, but yeah. you never know when they're going to come. It's, uh, it's, it's nerve-wracking after a while. After you make a few invasions, you, you figure, uh, how lucky can you get, you know? Well, you mentioned a moment ago you begin to feel my number is going to be up, you know, how, yeah. how often can I get out unscathed? Uh, was your ship ever hit? Yeah, we get hit. Not bad, we should get hit with shrapnel. Shrapnel a few times, uh, get a few holes in the stack. In fact, my, my loader on the 20 millimeter got hit with shrapnel. He got a purple hat. And I got hit the same time, but it wasn't bad like he did. I just got a, I just got a scrape across my leg. I didn't think it was anything. I didn't even go to sick bay, it wasn't anything. But, uh, 
the guy that got hit with me, his name was Fran Francis Higgins, I still remember his name. But uh, he, he was all right. Uh, he got a purple hat out of him. In fact, after I got out of the Navy, I put in for a tow with uh, three witnesses, but uh, they refused it, so I didn't pay any attention. I didn't care, really. I didn't, I didn't push it. In fact, we were in Naples. Uh, I think it was before we went to Andrew. We were in Naples when Vesuvius erupted. And of all the things that were happening, Vesuvius erupted and scattered the whole ship with dust. We, we took us away to clean up the dust of Vesuvius. <laughs> Did you begin to feel like the <laughs> character in Al Cap, that, you know, with this little cloud <laughs> over here? all this, and the Soviets had to hit us too. <laughs> now, Edna didn't try and get you. <laughs> you. We had quite experience over there in the Mediterranean then. Well, I got one more story to tell if you want to listen. Please do. Yes. Well, we, we had brought us to it. There was a, there was a English destroyer, the USS Holcomb. Was I don't know whether they radio for help saying they sent us in to, to help the Holcomb anyway because the Hulk, the uh, German sub just got through sinking a few freighters off Algiers so we went over there to, with the Holcomb and uh, we were only with the Holcomb a few hours maybe from oh maybe a thousand yards it was pretty close a couple hundred yards anyway. She took a torpedo midship. We just with her a little while. Took a torpedo midship. She was underneath the water within four minutes. The, the uh, Limey destroyers didn't have any watertight integrity. Well, the destroyer we got hit, we would have got sunk too, but we probably could have saved a few more lives. But anyway, they were all jumping in the water, and everything was. We saved. We brought uh, 96 of them aboard. And. Uh, we thought the submarine was still under us somewhere. We thought we were going to get next. Well, we were picking up them survivors, the whale boat and the gig, which put them in the water, you know, take, them a, take them aboard the ship. We want to see a mess, you take our arms. You guys are losing arms and legs, and the worst thing you, you could ever see. And we brought them a ship, and some of them died aboard. At night time, when it got dark, uh, there was, the, I don't know, it was just luck. They, uh, they radio a hospital ship. So we were still there laying too. We, we, uh, all the ones that needed help, we put them all on the hospital ship that night. And we were still there, and the uh, skipper radioed for help from another couple of destroyers that the sub was around us somewhere. So any of the, the other two cans, I forget what names they were, they finally got the sub that, that to sunk the Holcomb. We, we lucked out there. Isn't it unusual um, a ship is attacked within sight of where you are for you guys to pick, be picking up survivors? We put the whale boat in the gig right on the water to go and pick them up. That's right. But you, they, they, you, they, that's they a, deserve to get saved first. That that's a great to, risk to your ship though, isn't it? We thought sure we were going to get it. Yeah. That sub was still below us somewhere. And, uh, I don't know, I heard a story later on, I don't know how true it was. They, they captured, the, they got the other ship and, this, and the guy up for him, uh, the uh, skipper, they said, why didn't you, why didn't you torpedo the Niblack? He says, that we used our last torpedo on the Holcomb. Uh, I don't know how true that was. So you would have been next? We would have been next. Yeah. Uh, we, I don't think I told you about the subway sank. Not yet. <laughs> but <laughs> may I prevail upon you to mention that you're off of Algiers now, and you're uh, you've just seen a ship sink, be sunk, and then you transfer survivors off to a hospital ship. Where did you go from there? What did you do? Back to Iran. So you go back to North Africa. North Africa. Yeah. Okay. And how long were you there? Over well, there, we went back to the States, back to the States again, and uh, I'm forgetting about what, what time. Well, you know, I couldn't name the months and all that stuff, but uh, back to the States, then we came back. We came back overseas again. We came back to the Mediterranean again, and uh, that's when we, sunk, we got word about the, uh, 
there was Uno Rand, the, the uh, sent us out to this, uh, there was an RAF plane, uh, it's an uh, English plane, Royal Air Force. They spotted a sub out there, so we had orders to go out and try to get it. But we went out there and we contacted it and we lose it and contacted it. And the, uh, the other, uh, there's another ship uh, with us, the Ludlow, I forget her number. She was helping us out there too. We were both, I think it was about the second longest submarine hunt in the U.S. history. Excuse me. Second what? Second longest submarine hunt. It was 42 hours it took us to get this sub. And finally we we dropped oh, missing 50 or 60 depth charges on her before she come up. And when she come out of the water, she fired a fish at us. That's a torpedo and missed. She went down again and come up. This time when she came up, we're firing at the sub. There were men coming out of the Corning Tower. I was on the 20s too, I got a few of them coming out of the Corning Tower. And uh, we got seven, seven survivors we picked up out of the water. And one, one was the, was the uh, captain of the sub. He, uh, his name was Gunther, Gunther Heinrich. And they, as soon as we brought him aboard, it was me, I would have thrown him back in the water. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I wouldn't, today I wouldn't, but at that time. I mean, they're trying to sink you, but we didn't want to even bother, but at that time the skipper brought the seven aboard and brought him down a, brought him a forward part of the ship somewhere and stripped them all their clothes and so they didn't have any guns or anything on them. Put them under the shower just to make sure that there was no sabotage with them or something, you know what I mean? But then they interviewed them and uh, then we brought them back into a rain and put them, I guess the army or somebody took care of them. I take it the uh, the submarine itself sank that uh, oh, sure. as these guys are piling out of it, the ship is sinking. The yeah, five inch guns trying to sunk her. There's, there was no effort to go aboard uh, to try and salvage code books or anything like that? The sub? Yeah. When it was full of holes, by the time the five inches sunk her, it was it was all done. And really the depth charges were brought it up. You know, she was taking all those depth charges, they were powerful things. You didn't mention originally when we talked about the various jobs you had on board ship. You mentioned the five inch guns, the 20 millimeter cannon, the torpedoes. You haven't talked about depth charges. Uh, did you, were you ever involved in the Y gun or anything like that? No, uh, we had depth charges in the fan, fan tail, and then we had what they call the K guns on the support and starboard side. Mm -hmm. But I never had anything to do with them. They, they could set them for how, how deep they wanted to, for, for them to explode. But uh, I, I never worked any of the depth charges. Do you know uh, from talking to men who did um, how they determined the depth of the submarine, therefore... I think I, it was from the ping. From the From the, the ping uh, of sonar, the sonar gear. Yeah. I think they could uh, get an estimate of just how deep the sub was. So you set your uh, depth charges... Well, 300 feet or 600 feet or something. Yeah. That's quite a, a tower of water that goes up when one of those things goes off. We've had, we've had them dropping from the fan tail. We drop them and it would... It lift the fan tail up a little bit. You feel the pressure from them. It's a powerful, they're a powerful thing. I've lost track of of time here in the sense that. In fact, uh, all the, all this time that I was telling you about was mines. So I sank 26 mines with a 20 millimeter. 26. That's by firing at them. Just firing at them. Yeah. And when you fire them, they. To make them explode, you had to hit the detonator. Very, very seldom it would ever hit the detonator. You'd put a few holes in it, they'd just sink. But uh, if the, one of those mines, floating mines, are pretty good size. So they could sink a ship. In fact, one of our ships, the Mayo, got hit with a mine. She, she only got sunk, but she would uh, put a little bit of hole in it. Mine, mines have sunk quite a few ships at sea. Yeah, they're they're a powerful weapon. Herb. Um about what time is it in the the in the Mediterranean? Has has the has D Day come and gone in Europe? 
You know, when D-Day, when D-Day was, uh, when Hitler surrendered, they sent us out to the Pacific. Now, uh, I'm, I'm talking about the invasion of Normandy. Where well, were Normandy, you? We, yeah. were, we were, we were, we uh, were, when they were invading Normandy, we were invading southern France. Okay. Around Cannes and uh, Marseille and... Uh, so you were part of that fleet down oh, yeah. there. We, we got hit, we got hit, we didn't get hit, but we had a lot of bombs exploding all around us that time from the, the, uh, the land guns from the Germans. It was, it was a miracle. I still don't understand how we ever got back alive. A real miracle. On board a ship like that, and you're in the south of France, that is, you're in the, the Mediterranean, in, in, in part of the force that went against the south of France. How did you hear about what was happening up at Normandy? We didn't hear anything. We didn't hear we didn't get any, any news of what other ships were bombing anywhere. Or what we were doing, we did it. And we didn't know anything else was going on. Anyway. You were, you were pretty much uh, caught up with what you were doing yeah, right we there. Just, like, isolated. That enough to worry about in yeah. your own ship. Can you tell us about, you've mentioned the German uh, air power. Can you tell us about the the uh, U.S. air power over your head, the the planes that uh, supported your fleet? Oh well, yeah, we seen a few dogfights. They call them dogfights. The American pilots would fight the German planes. We seen a few dogfights in different invasions, and uh, I seen quite a few of them go down, land in the water. Did you see any of the uh, the great bomber fleets that were leaving North Africa to go up? and bomb Italy, did you see any of that? Oh yeah, yeah. We've seen them go by, yeah. What's that look like? Look great. <laughs> They're on our side, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Where are you now in time? You've uh, gone through the invasion of southern France, then you said you you went back to the States again from went there? Went back to the States, yeah, and then we uh, Germany surrendered, and uh, we got orders. We went down. We went on maneuvers again down in the Caribbean, and uh, we made quite a few trips back and forth, say from uh, Norfolk to New York, and I don't know what for, but we'd cover a lot of territory. Then we go down to Guantanamo Bay. We did, we did uh, exercises down there. Then we went through the Panama Canal. This is you know after Germany surrendered. Panama Canal. We. Uh, at San Diego and then out to Hawaii. And we were on maneuvers there. We were, we were getting ready to, to hit Japan. And uh, that's when uh, Harry dropped the bomb. Uh, so in late, after, after, uh, this, this, after Germany surrendered, you guys uh, hit the Caribbean and then the Panama Canal then out to Hawaii, so you felt you were going to be part of the invasion of Japan. Right. Where well, were you when you found you were not going to be part of that? When we're not going to be part of it? Yeah. Were you ever told the war is over or the bombs dropped or how close did, did you get to invading, uh, being part of that We fleet? didn't make any invasions up there. We were ready to hit Japan when Henry dropped the bomb. And, uh, where, where were you when the bombs were well, dropped? We were out at sea, but I don't know exactly where. I mean, Pacific's such a big place out there. But okay. We, we went down the Philippines. We went down to Mindanao and Mindanao and uh, Manila, uh, Manila, Philippines. But uh, what we were doing down there, I don't know. We're just right about that time too. That, that was when the Indianapolis sank. Remember, the Indianapolis got sunk out there. Yeah, from between Tinian and Manila, I guess. Yeah. That was unfortunate because it was lost for a couple of days. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. The poor fellows were in the water for some of them for three or four days. The sharks got a lot of them, I guess. The war is over and you're, you're out in the Pacific, is that correct? Uh, did you automatically then sit down and figure out how many points you had and 
uh, am I going to get yeah, home? Yeah, I guess everybody was looking over that. But You're counting Before we went right home, we went to Alaska, in fact. The Philippines, they sent us to Alaska, and Dutch Harbor and Kodiak, and uh, believe it or not, we had to take troops, Army personnel from Alaska down there to Seattle, Washington. We made a couple of trips back and forth, just a week. We didn't have any room for them, but we piled them in. We take them about 50, 100 at a time. They were just, using you as transports. Yeah. Isn't that just interesting? To, to bring them back from Alaska to Seattle, Washington, yeah. So they were emptying out the Aleutian Islands because yeah. the war was over. Okay, you're in Seattle and you still want to go home. What, yeah, what? we go back to Alaska, <laughs> take another trip back, and we finally got home anyway. So we're back through the Panama Canal after this, you know, up into Charleston and South Carolina. That was the end of the Charleston, South Carolina. It was uh, when I got off the ship, we took a cattle, cattle train home. You, you were on that ship uh, three years? Yeah. I was on it my length of my career. Three years, six months, and nine days. Well, except for in boot camp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is a sentimental question, but what's it like to drop the, the hook for the last time? You're in Charleston. This has been your home for a long, long time. Yeah. You know everybody on board like lifelong friends. Yeah. And then you all get on different trains, <clears throat> buses, and whatever, and like that, you're scattered to the winds. What's it feel like? Well, you lose a lot of friends, but I gained some toy. I still can keep in contact with one of our buddies uh, in Pennsylvania. And uh, there was uh, one other fellow who was called a gangplank owner. I think his name was Dexter Berry. He uh, lives down the Cape somewhere now. I haven't contacted him lately, but he was on the ship longer than anybody. That's all named Dexter. With what rank uh, were you discharged? Uh, petty officer, second class. Yeah. And can you tell us what uh, awards or medals you had? The six battle stars. And they never agreed to your Purple Heart, I take it? No. No, they refused me, but I didn't care. I, but you, I, I, I was lucky to get home. But you'd seen North African invasions, the Italian invasions, Sicily, and... Uh, Anzio, Salerno. Yeah. So you got quite a ride, didn't you? We made every invasion in, in Europe, yeah. Can you tell us, uh, was there a most memorable experience in your naval career that you could tell us about today? I'll tell you a funny thing happened. The captain of the submarine, Gunther Heinrich, later on this executive officer named Norris, living in Washington, D.C. after the war was over, he got a phone call and uh, Mr. Norris says, who's speaking? He says, my name is Gunther Heinrich. He says, you're the one that sunk my submarine. He said, could I meet you somewhere? <laughs> Mr. Norris told me at a reunion, he said, I was going to take a gun with me. He said, I don't know what this guy wanted. Anyway, he met him in a coffee shop. We met him in a park in Washington, D.C., and they, they went out and had a coffee and a meal or something, and uh, I guess they become friends after that. That's one for Ripley. <laughs> huh. I think I would have. Wa yes. What? Why do you want to meet? <laughs> What's well, on your mind? He was a little worried when he got that phone call. Yeah. <laughs> How about for you? Uh, all the things that happened to you. What stands out in your mind that you could tell us about? I think I told them all. I, uh... Was there a uh, memorable character, somebody that you uh, knew in three years? We had a few characters aboard. Some of them would sing songs, and other ones would just, I don't know, just, uh, just a bunch of good guys, you know. Kind of guys you'd be glad to be cooped up with for three yeah. years. <laughs> well, they, they were all good sailors, too. I mean, they, every, 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 everybody during World War II, Navy, Marines, Army, they were, they were, they, everybody in there was good. That's why we come out alive, I guess. 
Herb, was, the, um, was there a humorous experience that you can think of that happened to you or somebody aboard ship? Not that I can think of, no, not bad. But when one of the chiefs fell overboard going over the gangplank, that's about... That's uh, humorous right there. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that I haven't asked you here this morning uh, that you would like to put on the tape for your uh, family or friends or somebody looking at this a long way from now? Any story that I haven't asked you? Well, I'd like to thank the uh, library at the Institute, where I am now. I, like, I, I appreciate you uh, televising this, and I have a friend Charlotte Askin, I'd like to thank her for helping me through all this. That's very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.